Welcome to the Accelerate Church television broadcast. We are so glad that you are tuning in with us today. We believe today's message is going to strengthen and encourage you. So get your Bibles ready as Pastor Jeremy File is teaching today's message. Today I'm going to talk to you about where to draw the line. Where do you draw the line? Go to James chapter 1 and say, thank God for the word. All right, now I want everyone to say it like you mean it. Say, thank God for the word. There we go. James chapter one, verse 25. I'm about to call school back into session and do chapel because if I say, say it again, all the kids in this middle section scream at the top of their lungs, whatever I told them to say. I love that. They let me know they're in with all their heart. Are you in with all your heart this morning? Yeah. Praise God. God will speak to you. If, you. if you put distractions aside and focus on his word, amen. James, the first pastor said, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. What, what work are we talking about? What the perfect law of liberty says to do, right? That's, that's what's understood here. Notice you got to be a doer. You can't be a forgetful hearer. You've got to continue. You've got to look. There's four action points right there all on you. Did you catch that? Let me go back over it. He who looks, there's action step one. You've got to look into the word of God. Every day that you look into this thing is an opportunity for God to get involved. Somebody told me, I want to hear God speak to me. Read your Bible. He'll speak to you. And it's funny, people, they don't want to open their Bible. They want God to speak a voice. You better watch out. You may hear the devil speak. The Bible says, see, I know the Bible. The Bible says that he can appear as an angel of light. So if all you're doing is saying, Lord, speak to me, speak to me. Now God is speaking and he may speak something to you. And we talk about that sometimes, different things. But you can always know this. If it's God, it's going to line up with his word. So therefore, to get yourself attuned to, fine tuned with God. You got to spend a lot of time in his word. So you got to look into it. Number one, number two, you got to continue in it. God's not going to do any of these steps for you. Your wife can't do it. Your children can't do it. Your parents can't do it for you. You have got to look into it. You've got to continue in it. You can't forget what you heard. You got to be a doer of the work, a doer of the work. If you'll do those four things, look at this, this one, which one? The one that's qualified that does those four things. This one will be blessed in what he does. Now, I've never met any Christian that doesn't want to be blessed in everything they do. Now, everybody I met, they want to be blessed in what they're doing, but they don't necessarily want four action points. <laughs> they say, Lord, if God wants to be blessed, I'll be blessed. It's not so, my friend. You've got to look into what? The perfect law. Everybody say the perfect law. God's word is the perfect law of liberty. That's a great way to describe it. That's another name for the word of God, the perfect law of liberty. You know what I like about law? Law is law. And nature and God has revealed in nature his natural law that we should all follow. And this is a country that the founders talked along these lines quite a bit. I don't have time to take a detour there, though I, I have been studying in my founder's Bible lately. And if you remember a few weeks ago, I preached to you about the founding of this nation. I will just say this, this nation is the land of the free and home of the brave. One reason we have those type of names is because it was founded on the perfect law of liberty. I will say in this country for many decades, almost, well, more than a century from the beginning of this country, if you were going to be an attorney of law, you had to take Bible courses in universities, which by the way, the Ivy League, Harvard, all those started as Christian universities. They all did. You may not know that. You sure wouldn't know it now if you see some of the people graduating. No offense. But I'm just saying, uh, used to, we understood something in this country that law and the basis of law was found on the word. Now that's under attack. Here about a little more than a year ago, I had a doctor's appointment and I was talking to the doctor and he found out I'm a pastor. And so he says to me in the doctor's office, well, I'm feeling a little bit vulnerable. What is the law based on? 
I said, well, the Word of God. Well, what specifically in the Word of God? I said, I like to go back to the ones that God etched in stone with his finger. That doctor said, nope, that's the law of Moses. I said, no, it's not. You see, those commandments, nine are repeated in the New Testament. And you are observing the one that's not repeated by being here on Sunday. We just don't do it on Saturday. That's why it's not repeated verbatim in the New Testament. But the principle is still there that you're to take a day of rest. You're to honor God with that day. And that's called a Sabbath, right? That's not directly commanded you in the New Covenant. But all the other nine are directly mentioned. So therefore, I don't care if you're a doctor, I don't care who you are. You're not going to convince me. He came way too late to tell me that God didn't mean what he said when he wrote in stone. And by the way, he didn't need two stones because he has a big fat finger. <laughs> he had a reason behind that. I, I, all these detours I'm wanting to take, I'm going to stay on point today. I've, God's given me a word for you today. I, I want to touch that, but I, I'll just say there's a reason behind that. Someday, hopefully I'll get to cover that of why it was on two different tablets. But, but today, I want you to catch this. You have to be the one to look into the perfect law of liberty. I think it's interesting that in the new covenant, this is called a law. Because there's so many people that when you say law, they recoil. We're not under the law. You're right. The ceremonial law of Moses, Jesus fulfilled it. That's 100% accurate. But Jesus also established a new and better covenant by the shedding of his blood. And it's up to you and I to look into that perfect law and to see what that new covenant requires of us. The very first time we came uh, to check out Accelerate, um, I believe my husband came with me that very first time, um, and I knew that that's what I wanted. I knew that's what I knew that that's where I was called. Um, so, me and the kids continued to come back um, every Sunday and every Wednesday. I remember women were thinking that I was the single mom because my husband wasn't there, but I remained faithful and I kept coming. I would say at that point, our marriage was rocky. Um, I know that had we not stopped or started coming to church, I wouldn't be married today. That was something that I didn't ask him and wake him up every morning and say, you coming this time? Or, you know, Wednesday, you coming today? I just kept coming and I'll say, hey, we're going to church. See you later. And like I said, I remained faithful. I prayed for him and it was like this one empty seat, like one day he's going to fill this seat. <laughs> oh. So that morning was just like our normal chaotic Sunday morning, getting ready to go. Um, I was in the kitchen, you know, getting the kids breakfast and stuff ready and walked back into my room where my husband was normally still asleep and he was up putting on a button up shirt and I remember him just, oh, sorry. <laughs> I remember him buttoning his shirt up that morning and I knew he wasn't going to the gym because he was wearing a button up shirt. So I was like, well, where are you going? And he said, I'm coming with you to church. So I said, okay. And then I walked out, I was like, praise the Lord, he's coming. <laughs> you know, after my husband came to church with me, um, after those months, I was, I think we were at home after church and I said, well, what caused you to come like with us to church? And he said, honestly, I've seen a change in you and I wanted what you have. I would say right around that time, um, I thought my marriage was over. And that statement alone was confirmation that it's not. And for him to see that change in me, because I kept showing up, now he keeps showing up. And my kids keep showing up. And now we have his little brother. I would say like my personal little motto for anything is keep showing up. and. I continually showed up. I didn't care that people thought I was a single mom or that I didn't have a husband at home. But one thing I would not do, hold on. Um, don't nag them, just pray for them and they'll show up. And that's, that's another thing too, it, you showing up and being faithful is going to change the trajectory of everyone behind you and everyone after you because one little 
thing that I had in my mind to remain determined and to keep showing up, it changed my family. It brought me and my husband closer together. It has really strengthened our family. Like I said, we have custody of his little brother now. So now we're changing his trajectory and those after him. We have custody of my stepdaughter. We're changing the trajectory of her life. So you remaining faithful and diligent is gonna affect more than just you. If you scorn God and his way of doing things, you listen to ungodly counsel, all of those things, sin, ungodliness, right? All this scorning, mocking God. Guess what? Those are paths that lead to destruction. And if you are buddies with people that are on those paths, they're trying to get you on that path with them because it makes them feel better to see a Christian with them. And when you said, Lord, I surrender, you didn't realize what you were doing. You are now saying, okay, you draw the lines in my life. And now people are reading you as a Bible. What are they reading, by the way? You writing your own book, first and second and third hesitations? Or is it actually in the Bible, your lifestyle, the fruit of your life? Well, here's how you engage it. Is everything you're doing prospering? You don't go by your, by the way, your standard. Well, I don't know what prosperity is. Well, that could mean a whole bunch of different things. But let me just tell you this. Prosperity is more than enough. More than enough. That's prosperity. Lack, not enough. That's not prosperity. So you just look at your life. You just look at your life and examine it with an open, honest heart. Instead of being so touchy all the time. I'll tell you, this snowflake generation is just, it's a sad case, man. It is a sad case. It's unbelievable. But I want you to catch this. If you're going to be blessed, the law of the Lord has got to be your delight. I said, if you're going to be blessed, the law of the Lord has to be your delight. Can I get an amen? amen. Again, that doesn't mean the ceremonial law of Moses. I want to make that distinction because people hear this of television and different places. I'm not talking about you go back and you got to take a lamb to the temple and all that goes with that. No, no. Jesus fulfilled that, but he's established that new covenant that has laws. Again, I want to repeat. It's worth repeating because when you preach like this, people like to run to the ditch with it. Jesus did not start a movement of lawlessness. In fact, he said this in John 14, six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He did not say, I am a way, a truth, a life. I am the. And you got to catch this. That changes everything. This is absolute law in the New Testament. What is? The only way now to God the Father is that you got to come through Jesus. No one, he said, comes to the Father except through me. This statement is New Testament law. And you got to start looking and asking the Lord, show me, Lord, what is it? If you listen to anybody or any influence anywhere that tries to tell you, well, all people and all religions are all seeking their own way to God. They're all going to God. That is not true. Jesus made this statement and this is law. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way for you to make it other than Jesus. I think you got that in this church, but I, I want to reiterate that repetition is key. If, if you don't continue to hear things like this, you're going to get worn down with what you're hearing in this culture. Because in this culture, people are saying things like love is love. People are saying things like, who am I to judge, man? Everybody's a child of God. Not true. Only those following the way, the truth, and the life are on the way to heaven. Wow. You got to know this. The kingdom of God operates by laws. The New Testament, the new covenant, testament and covenant are interchangeable words. So when I say the new Testament, yes, I'm talking about Matthew through revelation, but I'm also talking about the new covenant. Okay. And the new covenant works by certain laws Four just came right out of my spirit. And I said, I'm going to show you all four of these. I don't, there's scripture for all of them, but I don't want to turn there. I just want you to look at the screen. Jot this down. Here's some of the laws mentioned in the new Testament. John 14, six is one, but look at number one, the law of Christ is mentioned. 
the law of Christ. Well, I, I could take time and each one of these deserves its own sermon, but I'm not going to do that. The law of Christ basically is this. You've broken his law. You need a Messiah. There's not one of you in here that hasn't told a lie, stolen something, used God's name, lusted for someone you're not married to. And I've gone through that many, many times. Yes, that's a good way to witness, to use the law. That's what it's for, actually. The law back there, when you say that, it's good. It's for the sinner. What? What part? Showing everybody this is what God required. You broke it all. You need a Messiah. Now in the New Testament, that's the law of Christ. Until you recognize the position you're in and that you need a savior, you're not ready to live as a new covenant Christian. Is that clear? So the law of Christ. Number two, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's a law. See, if anything, once again, tries to leech the life of God off of you and out of you, then you know, wait a minute. If I continue to spend time in that thing, and then eventually that starts taking up a part of my life, I'm going to violate the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. See, I've got to stay around the life of Christ. This is why church attendance is so important. See, you may come here, I may not deal with the exact thing you're dealing with, but actually this today is dealing with your life. The third law mentioned in the New Testament is the law of faith. See, without faith, no man can please God. With faith, all things are possible. Look at the two <laughs> dichotomies there. No one can please God without faith. Hebrews says that, chapter 11. But then again, you're going to have to have faith to get anything in the kingdom. Let me just tell you like this. It's as if God skips over all humanity just to move on the behalf of the person that's in faith. You can stay up to date with everything happening at Accelerate Church by downloading our app. Add events directly to your calendar, receive notifications when services are going live, hear previous sermons preached by Pastor Jeremy, and you can even give right there from your mobile device. The Accelerate Church app has everything you need right there in the palm of your hand. Head over to your app store today and type in Accelerate Church Amarillo to download to your mobile device. So when I ask, where do you draw the line? What, how do you determine right and wrong? If you disregard or ignore God's word and his commands, you have no standard to go on. It's just opinion. Now, this is what I think. We don't want to know what you think. What does the Bible say? But I've got to know. I've got to know. I, I'm leading a family. I looked at my seven children. I said, man, this is no small feat the Lord has handed to me and my wife to train these children. Yeah. So see, what do you do? I wasn't even planning to mention this, but where do you draw the line? I talked to my dad this week. He played my mom miniature golf, only beat her by two strokes. And as he was bragging to me about it, he told me a story that uh, <laughs> he was bragging, wasn't he, mom? He was bragging about it. I spanked her good. I was like, what was the score? <laughs> beat her by two strokes. Oh, that ain't, that ain't no spanking. That's just, oh, some people... Like Garrett, we call that luck. <laughs> Just messing with you. He doesn't believe in luck, he said. But my dad took the pencil from that miniature golf place, and he was going about his business. They went somewhere else, and he realized he took the pencil. Now, I will say this. I've played a lot of golf and miniature golf. They expect to give you those pencils. I do know that. But my dad's like this. He told me, he said, you know what? I drove back over there because he said, I thought about this. I had my three-year-old boy, you, talking about me, take a Tootsie Roll back and drove 32 miles round trip to take that back. He said, I'm going to take this pencil back and take it back. And the guy's like, you didn't have to bring that back. You, you know. Well, then I was like, that's a neat story, dad. Wow, that's quite a high standard. That's where he drew the line. That's the kind of man he is. He didn't know I was going to share it publicly. I didn't even ask his permission. But I told it anyway. Well, then we decided to stop at Uncle Julio's in Oklahoma City. I hadn't even told my wife the story. She didn't hear it until right now about my dad taking the pencil back. I don't think. Maybe I told her later. But uh, I don't remember telling her. But I know this. We were leaving. And I was waiting to pay the bill or whatever. So I, I'm coming out. And she's walking back in. I said, what's going on? She said, I found something out in the parking lot. Okay. Well, I said, come on, let's go. So we go and we get in the vehicle and we go to get, I'm going to have to admit, this is confessional again, Krispy Kremes. <laughs> Just what I needed after eating fajitas at Uncle Julio's. 
It's a wonder I'm fitting my suit today. Good, no. But she looks this thing up. She's like, this thing is worth at least $1,000. I said, well, somebody's going to be missing that. So while we're in line and we're just right, we can still see the restaurant's just up the hill there. We're going to take that back. And uh, I asked my wife this. I said, same thing I take my children through, but they're all watching us. They're watching us in the back. Now, that's a nice, nice little piece of jewelry, right? Could have been worth more than that, by the way, if the diamonds are real, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, minimum $1,000. I said, somebody's going to be missing that. I said, if this was yours, what would you want someone to do? My wife said, I'd want them to turn it back in because I'd retrace my steps and I would call and say, did this happen? I said, let's go. Because you always know this. There's your line. When you come on something and you're like, I don't really know what to do, what's right. I mean, it's out in the parking lot. You could have somebody, if they saw that, just, that's mine. So I was pretty discreet when I took it back in because I said, someone's going to be looking for this. There were people standing all around. I didn't want them to see it, right? Because it'd be like our society be like, oh, that's mine. I, I, yeah, I dropped that. <laughs> right? But, you know, the real, the real owner is going to be the one that's going to say, come looking for it. It looks like this, right? So the point being, where do you draw the line? Here's where I draw the line. What would I want done to me? If I don't want it done to me, then why am I going to do it? Now, I've told my kids that over and over, but I told my wife as we were driving home last night, I said, and by the way, I think that's one reason God gets you through a storm, by the way. <laughs> See, we want God to get us through the storm, but are we willing to do the right thing before the storm? When it was clear. I'm just wondering. See what I'm talking about? So, I'm just saying this. I said, all, all the kids are watching. They'll never forget that. Because she showed the, the girls in particular were interested. I don't know that the boys are paying close attention, but the, the girls were looking, whoa, that's that expensive. Oh, wow. And they won't forget that we took it back. See, now it's not good enough for me just to teach that to them. Now you can't do it. And then we do the opposite. That ain't going to fly. And you need to learn this. If you're having trouble with training your children, it's because you're drawing the wrong lines. I feel like this is suddenly becoming a series. I thought this was going to be a one shot. I want you to know it's mainstream in America for each person to live according to their standard of what's right and wrong. So what they've actually done, see, is they've constructed their consciences out of popular opinion instead of the word of God, specifically the law of liberty. Therefore, they can't correctly tell the difference between right and wrong. I know that's a mouthful. I feel like I need to repeat it because I want you to catch this. It's now mainstream in America for each person to live according to their own standard of what's right and wrong. What have many people done? They've constructed their consciences out of popular opinion instead of God's laws. Therefore, they can't correctly tell the difference between right and wrong. But I want you to know that we will see the power of God when we make his standard our standard. Just like in the book of Acts, go there, Acts chapter 5. Spaghetti's heating up. You're not going to starve today. I'm going to preach a little bit longer. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. I'm sure Josh and Whitney are back there saying, praise the Lord. Are you youth going to leave whenever I have Sabrina come up? Is that when you are going to leave? Is that what you all been instructed? This means yes? Okay, perfect. I heard yes, sir. That's good. Acts 5, verse 12. Look at this. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. Wow. I'm going to show you why this kind of power was on them. They were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. That's an interesting verse. Acts 5, verse 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets. Look at this. They laid them on the beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Well, that's some power right there. Peter walks by, his shadow hits you, and you, whoo, I'm up and walking. I couldn't walk before that. Glory to God. That's some power. I want you to know why they had that kind of power because they raised their standard to meet God's standard. Yes. Glory to God. 
They brought the sick out. They wanted his shadow to touch. So passing by, maybe to follow him. Verse 16, Acts 5. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people. So word spread to other cities now. Those who were tormented by unclean spirits, they were all healed. Glory to God, all healed. You'd think everyone in the region would rejoice about that. Well, then the high priest rose up. And all those who were with him, which is a sect of the Sadducees, so you know they're going to be sad. It's part of their name. And they were filled with indignation. What? They weren't rejoicing? Sounds like a lot of Christians I've heard. I've seen this in my immature children too, by the way, that are young. We have to train them. When someone else gets something, <laughs> I didn't get it. Oh, you're supposed to rejoice with them. You selfish thing, you repent. No need to be sad because someone else is blessed. That's acting like the sad, you see. They laid their hands on the apostles. Uh-oh. They laid their hands. That's not a good thing either. They put them into the common prison. But at night, look at this. Look at this power. An angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. An angel? Wow. Did you know angels are ministering spirits set aside for us? And these guys had them working right here. They come and open prison doors. Glory to God. See, money can't buy this. Money can't buy an angel showing up and setting you free out of prison. <laughs> he said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people what? All the words of this life. The words of life. Go and get in the temple and go preach. That's the reason we've been set free. They didn't say go down to the liquor store. Drink a little bit with the sinners. What did they say? The angel said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people. Well, that does conclude today's television broadcast. But if you would like to hear more from Pastor Jeremy File, we invite you to head over to our website at AccelerateChurch.cc and click on the media tab. There you will find every sermon that Pastor Jeremy has preached for your convenience. If you are in the Amarillo area, we would love to meet you in person. We are located at 4400 South Crockett here in Amarillo. And our service times are Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. If you're not from Amarillo, we would still love to hear from you. You can email us at info at accelerate.church.cc or give us a call. We want to know how can we pray for you? Where are you watching and tuning in from? We are so glad that you tuned in with us today.